So Jim Chang is, is uh, I think, uh, an absolutely amazing example of, of the type of entrepreneurship that really is prevalent here uh, in the D.C. region in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, Jim is somebody who started out his, his career, got a good education, uh, and ultimately became an entrepreneur and started a government services IT company. Um, grew it from, I think, three employees, five employees, to uh, a lot of employees about 90 million dollars of revenue and and sold it and uh, the second third and fourth act of jim's life has been uh, a series of being a very active and effective uh, mentor and advocate and angel investor for startups uh, jim just came off spending four years working in the cabinet of uh, Governor mcdonald's administration uh, he was the secretary of commerce and trade he was very effective at that he spends a lot of time working in asia bringing up businesses to the united states he was uh, very instrumental in, in just uh, uh, helping our new governor uh, put in place a very interesting uh, paper mill deal, which we'll talk about. Uh, and Jim is just generally uh, a great friend for the entrepreneurial community, a great advocate. So I, I couldn't think of a better person for us to start our, our fall series with than my friend Jim Chen. So here we are. So, so Jim, thanks very much for agreeing to this. I know you have no idea what's going to happen next. So, <laughs> no idea. And the good news is, is that we've known each other a long time, so you have a track record that usually works out OK. Usually. Usually, and today it will. So, so Jim, let's go back to the Wayback Machine. When did you first start thinking about being an entrepreneur? Well, Jonathan, yeah, uh, and again, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, and I can't for, for having me here. It's great to be here. In, uh, these nice offices in Arlington. Arlington so, County has got good space. Yeah. We're lucky to be I here. I took the Metro in, so uh, another from, great example. From Silver Line, the brand new Silver Line. And, <laughs> <laughs> Government could be a force for good. Who knows? <laughs> and I was in Richmond for four years, so I didn't have to go through the traffic of construction. Uh, so now I can experience the great thing that is the Silver Line. So it's fantastic. There you go. Um, and that's when you decide you want to be an entrepreneur. Today you're on the Metro, <laughs> so I should do this. Anyway, okay. Well, I'll tell you. Um, uh, Actually, you got my story, so you pretty much told my whole story, except I, I was actually an entrepreneur way before that. Uh, I delivered newspapers when I was 10 years old. 10 years old? Yeah, so I thought about being an entrepreneur. I'm a serial entrepreneur that way, by the way. So uh, uh, 10 years old, uh, actually the cutoff was 11 years old, and I lied. So, uh, statute of limitations gone, but uh, I actually- So you think? I, <laughs> I didn't check, but you know, New York State, so, uh -huh. uh, there you go. So what was it about, because um, not every kid I know uh, hits 10 and lies about their age to start working. What, what was it about uh, your life experience at that point that encouraged you to, to want to do something like that? I wanted money, and I was, and we, we were, my dad was a student and, uh, and a professor, so we were poor growing up, uh -huh. uh, but had, uh, my, the, my dad was an immigrant from, from China, from Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, had that immigrant, uh, the whole immigrant experience, uh, mm -hmm. which said, hey, you gotta work hard, and you gotta make your own money. Uh, we didn't have anything called allowances or anything back then, so you hit 10, and he said, here's a paper route, let's go make some money, and I got my brother involved, so I actually subcontracted. <laughs> so you immediately became a contractor. So you immediately became a capitalist and started exploiting the working class. Well, Perfect. Yes, yeah, yeah, just no, I'm just kidding. But, but, but you learned a very valuable lesson very early on, which is you can make more money if you involve other people in your activity. Exactly. Right? It took me 50 years to learn that. <laughs> That's why we're here, Jim. We learn from each other. So. But again, I, I just think to myself, all right, that's an interesting story. And, and one that I've heard um, from many of, of the folks that I've interviewed over the last couple of years, how much of a role do you think um, either the, the immigrant experience or growing up without a lot of wealth drives people to be entrepreneurial? Well, that's certainly a, a big part of it. Um, I think uh, uh, my dad, when he came over, uh, he showed me entrepreneurship. He was working his way through school. And the way he did that was he uh, was an electrical engineer, mm -hmm. and he fixed TVs. And back then, 60s, TVs were tubes. And so he'd test the tubes and rewire the wires, and uh, uh, that's how he worked his way through school with uh, two little kids and a wife, uh, graduate school. And so you learn that watching the immigrants. You, you watch the immigrant story. And I, I had my dad my my mom to, to be a great uh, mentor. And they're still very active. He's still a professor, isn't he, down at ODU? He's retired. He's, he's retired. retired. He's in his age, but uh, yeah. But he's still very active. And 
He's still running businesses through the new the new uh, uh, economy uh, on Amazon and eBay and all that. He's is he really? Things. I don't know. What, what is he, he selling? Want to. He's selling on vacuum tubes. He what is he selling? Uh, he, he, he'll do that. Too. I bet he would. <laughs> I bet he would. So so you grow up you grew up in an environment. Um, it sounds a lot like like my own job. You know, my dad with the fishery, for example. I I think that it is interesting to ask whether or not somebody can be an entrepreneur if they're comfortable. What oh, do you think? well, uh, you know, there's the whole golden handcuffs story, and uh, I know a lot of people that said, well, you know, I couldn't get my, uh, you know, I couldn't get a raise, I couldn't get my promotion. They mm -hmm. hit the glass ceiling, the bamboo ceiling, the whatever ceiling. Mm -hmm. They said, you know. I get a good idea, I know of an opportunity, let's go and do it. Uh, but, but I've been seeing more of folks, and, and of course, that is a great option. Entrepreneurship is a great option for folks that, that hit ceilings that they, they want to overcome. And uh, it's a great option for special minorities. Um, a lot of women hit, the, hit the, uh, the, the glass ceiling. And so we see a lot more people going into that. Uh, if you're comfortable, yeah, uh, you have to convince more people like your spouse that right. you're not crazy. Right. I'm going to give up this great job or explain to your parents or whatever, mm -hmm. and I'm going to take this huge risk, invest all my money, and maybe some of yours, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and do this uh, great endeavor. But those people have passion, and they really want to do it. So it, it could, I think a lot of those, um, those that are comfortable, mm -hmm. have a comfortable option, they can come up with even more destructive ideas. I often wonder if, uh, if if it's that people who are comfortable are an entrepreneurs, or whether it is that there's something there's an entrepreneurial gene that right that that makes entrepreneurs unable to be comfortable. Uh, I that? think that's well. I, some people would call it ADD, right? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> that's a cheap and easy joke. Sorry. Squirrel. Yeah. <laughs> Look a pony. Anyway, but but it's not ADD though. It's different because ADD uh, is is the inability is is uh, the inability to ever see things through. And one of the things that entrepreneurs are really good at is seeing things through. I mean, they're they're execution machines. I find so. I, I would agree to a certain extent. I think uh, there's a certain group of entrepreneurs that I know, some of them are in this audience, mm -hmm. that love to start things, that have great ideas, that know how to mm -hmm. do the initial execution of their raising money, know how to get the crowd pumped up and build some traction in their products. Mm -hmm. uh, one, of those, one of my partners out there, yeah. you may be another one, <laughs> yeah, they're really good at starting these things, and then, right. you know, they can't wait for the exit, uh, they can't wait for the next round, they can't wait for the real long-term CEO to come in because they want to start the next thing. Mm -hmm. There's just something about the excitement of mm -hmm. entrepreneurship, the excitement of building a company, starting a company uh, that, that gets them going. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think that uh, that may be one of the things that I see most often is, is that entrepreneurs love the journey as much as the end, even more than the end point. That's right. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. So another thing. Although the end point is isn't bad. It's, it's, well, as long as it's not, we talk about exit, right? Well, zero x return, you know, that's bad. One x return. Anything above one x, right. one times your investment is okay. Is okay. You want the hundred, you want the ten, mm -hmm. but uh, you, you'll settle for a three or four. So you don't you don't sort of go with the, the Jeopardy approach, where it's thanks for playing, and you know here's this board game on yeah, the way you out. You don't like that. Okay, so entrepreneur is about winning to a certain extent. Then. Sure. Okay. Although the badge of honor, you can have a couple losses when you're you know early on. Uh -huh. you better not have losses later. I would argue that the best entrepreneurs have failed. Actually. Oh sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. You have to have that experience. Mm -hmm. So, so you were a, a paper boy. Uh, is that a derogatory term these darn, days? Darn good one too. A darn good one. Yeah. I, in, I, the, yeah. in the world of political correctness, I mean, you know, you were paper pusher. No, that's weird. No. <laughs> paper. Anyway, okay, enough of that. So, you you were paper boy and going along and, and but you didn't go from paper boy to starting a, an IT company. What what was in between? Oh, uh, well, I was 10 or 11 years old. I know. I, I know you started your business when you were six, I thought. So. Well, okay. um, you know, back then, uh, of course, that was the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got a degree in computer science. Um, I followed my dad to Old Dominion University. He was the department chair, and I got really good grades. <laughs> <laughs> Strangely enough, mm, uh, that I in computer science. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the nice thing was I, I got access to all the computers. I could play around and write programs and just... Uh, Geeky delight, you know, and uh, so uh, I really enjoyed that. And uh, but then my dad started the company, and we worked in it, and uh, eventually got into government contracting. When we found out it was very difficult to compete uh, in, 
in the real world when we're talking about international businesses and things like that. Yeah. Up against the big, the giants, the IBMs mm -hmm. of the world, the computer access of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, very difficult to compete. Mm -hmm. But there's still opportunities in government contracting. There's a lot of uh, folks in this audience probably. Government contractors also. Mm -hmm. Not easy, <coughs> government contracting is not easy, but at least the rules are spelled out a little more clearly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, we got into government contracting and uh, with my dad. And eventually, uh, we grew from a small company to a medium-sized company. And I found some really nice opportunities uh, that he could no longer bid on because he was getting too big. Interesting. So I said to myself, I've always wanted to have my own business, other than the newspaper thing, which was very exciting, apparently. But uh, it was a few years off uh, at that time. Uh, so uh, I said, look, it's now or never. And uh, it was 1995. Really nice opportunities coming up, uh, and I know I knew some of the folks that uh, I could bring on really quickly for very little money, or just promises. You, you know how that works, just promises. I'm seeing a recurring <laughs> pattern in your life. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I took advantage of that. Got a nice twenty-five million dollar contract, and uh, I, I, with my dad's blessing, I, I left for my own company. Hmm. And uh, um, the uh, SBA was a big help, and that got a small business certification got a $25 million contract, and, and that was the start of uh, my uh, main company, CHM, that I sold 10 years later. Mm -hmm. uh, built it and said we had uh, about five people to start, and when we sold it, it was about 550 folks. So we, we built it up over uh, nine years. Great folks there, uh, and uh, sold it to another company, uh, another company a little bit larger than us, and they sold it to a giant company a year later, and uh, very fortunately, I got a little bit of um, uh, uh, benefit from, from that sale, too. So, uh, maybe a little bit. Well, we're, in, we're in favor of the, uh, the fish eating the fish. That's right. That's okay. It's interesting. So, two things that I think of as you describe that story. That the first one is, um, let's start here. What's it like, and what kind of challenges do you have as an entrepreneur going from a five-person company where you know everybody to a 20, 50, 100-person company? How does it change, and how did you manage that change? Very difficult change. Luckily, it didn't happen that quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, but once we built up steam, oh, it was it, contracts uh, came in a lot faster. Uh, you know, you have to build your reputation and track record for the federal government. Mm -hmm. At least at that time, you know that that was where the pendulum was swinging: best value versus low price, and, and, and all that. At that time, uh, it was a lot about uh, reputation, about track record. So uh, we grew it fairly, fairly quickly, and the main thing was finding the right folks, uh, the right managers, uh, the right people to uh, uh, manage and, and help your strategy on how to grow. So uh, hired a lot of folks, and the tough part was some of the folks that we started with, I couldn't promote all the way. I had to get new folks uh, uh, to take the reins uh, for certain divisions. But we're better managing in large organizations. Sure. You mentioned it earlier. I think one of the interesting uh, challenges that most entrepreneurs face is, particularly ones who like starting businesses, is the skill to scale a business is extremely different from the skill required to start a business. It's, it requires a lot more organization, a lot more focus on things like culture and compensation and all the minutia that frankly is not particularly exciting to people who like to start businesses, right? You got it right there. <laughs> so how come you stuck with it? What was it about it that kept you in the game? When many of our friends say, well, that was fun here, let's find somebody else to run it. What kept you engaged? Why was it still fun? Well, it was, it was absolutely fun all the way through because it was still a learning experience for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, wanted, I wanted to see what's nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And at some point, and, and this is the story about 2000, uh, leading to 2005, is originally we were looking to other companies to buy. And we bought, we made some very small acquisitions. Uh, but at one point, we met a company uh, that actually had a stronger uh, financial backing than we did for takeovers. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that took us over. So uh, you, had to, you had to sort of uh, be a little bit ego free because. When, when we talk about selling companies and buying companies, you want your name on top of that tombstone, the, the thing you get when you, when you sell, right? Mm -hmm. The little, little things that says X acquired Y. You want to be the X acquiring Y, right? Uh -huh. uh, so you have to make that decision. Is it for an ego or is it for family stability? You know, I wanted to 
to cash out for my family. But then again, I got an ego. I wanted to grow my company larger. You have to sort of make a balance. And uh, uh, at that time, I said, you know, it's more valuable for me to keep my wife happy, my, my, my family happy, uh, and, and to maybe explore new options than it is to just grow my company so it's, it's large and uh, eventually sell it uh, possibly anyway. So that's very emblematic of another question that I'm often asked. Uh, once an entrepreneur has a business going and it starts to, to go along, um, they'll often say to me, when should I sell? What would you tell somebody to say, when should I sell my business? You should sell at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it turns out, it turns out uh, the, the year I sold uh, was 2009. And, you know, very unfortunate, 9-11 uh, happened. And, uh, uh, but for government contractors, yeah, tragedy, we just, you know, it's September 7th. 17th today, so uh, you know it's still in our minds, and it's very deep tragedy. Uh, but for government contractors, we experienced sort of a renaissance in our valuations of our companies back then. And so you, know, you, you can't always sell at the peak of value, but we came very close, and so it was the right time. And uh, companies, the larger companies, uh, their valuations went up because people saw, hey, defense spending, uh, government spending. Uh, wow, there's some money there. So let's value these companies very highly. So uh, the, the valuations of companies like the one I, I had uh, were actually pretty high at that time. Mm -hmm. And so it made a lot of sense. Uh, who knows how long that was going to last? Uh, maybe it would let, maybe it'd keep on doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not the way government contracting works. So uh, uh, that was that was the right time. Uh, but it was also, uh, you know, what are you interested in? Are, and I say this, I said this to my wife a long time ago, and she says it back to me now that I'm exploring what I'm doing. It's uh, you don't identify yourself as what you do. You should be yourself. Right? You shouldn't uh, be your company. You shouldn't be so engrossed in your company that you can't think of your family, you know, uh, can't think of your spouse, uh, can't think of your other loved ones or, or your community. You can't be just so targeted just for, for, to, for business and making money. You should think about other things. So uh, that was. That was part of the decision. I, I think that uh, for me, that the advice that I will generally give is businesses never get um, sold, they get bought. And your story is a great example of that. I, every time I'm in my portfolio or any time I've been involved with the company, the, the entrepreneurs say it's time to sell. That's the worst time to sell. The best time to sell is when, some, when you're, as it sounds like newer, you're going along, you're minding your own business, and suddenly you have an opportunity. Right? Then that seems to be what makes more sense to me. I've, I've met so many entrepreneurs that, and, and of course, Jack, we know a lot of serial entrepreneurs. Um, and I know a lot of folks that are uh, on their way looking for their next opportunity. And that's, that's what keeps them going. That's what keeps them excited and, and uh, with more experience, uh, even more excitement. So uh, you're absolutely right. The other thing that I will say, and, and I've seen this work out very well, is you should always know what your number is. Um, what I mean by that is you should have a rough idea of what your business is worth to you and what number you'd accept for your business that would uh, allow you to sell it without remorse. Because the time to figure that out is not after somebody's asked. Right? You'd be surprised, yeah. Well, I'd pro you'd probably not be surprised, but uh, a lot of folks still don't know that number. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Coming to that number is very important because that's part of my decision was, well, what's it worth? <coughs> right. Uh, uh, it, it was a tough decision uh, to sell or to go that direction because one, the ego, right? Mm -hmm. You can't forget the ego. Mm -hmm. uh, but but also, um, uh, you know, is that number good for me? And will that give me the runway uh, for the next thing? Right. So the other thing that came out of your story that I want to touch on was, um, you're emblematic, I think, of, of how this region has benefited from close proximity to the government, the government contracting and government technology services. And we have a lot of, uh, a lot of great companies, a lot of wealth that's been created over the last 20 years through, through this cycle. I get the sense that that story is, uh, and that, uh, that game is ending a little bit right now because of sequestration changes in the budget. Are you seeing that as well as you talk with your friends in the government contract industry? Are we seeing a, a sea change in, in the region and its relationship with the government? You know, I think there's a lot of fear of that, and definitely it's, you know, everybody tells me, it, it, you know, it's, it's sort of like uh, everything is tougher now. Oh, remember the good old days when it was so easy. Yeah, I don't think it was so easy back then. 
uh, and I still think there's a lot of opportunities right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have to be very sharp, and you have to know your markets, and it can't be the same old thing. So, yeah, we, we fear that that's, that's coming, mm -hmm. uh, but we also know the government's not too good at paring down without spending money. Mm -hmm. They pare down, but they spend more money somehow. Mm -hmm. And so the secret is to find it. Mm -hmm. So you spend a lot of time now um, working on international transactions in, in, in your life, and you spend some overseas. How how, uh, how do you compare um, emerging com uh, economies like China to, to the United States? Are, are there lessons we should be learning from the Chinese now that maybe aren't uh, generally appreciated by the American business culture? Yes. Uh, I think the main thing, with, especially with China, is that uh, um, you know, Americans, uh, we tend to view ourselves in a bubble. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities in China right now if you know how to play your cards. Uh, very hard to do business in China if you're in the United States. Uh, on the other hand, I think the lesson is do not, do not ignore the rest of the world. Right now, there's a lot of innovation in China. They have research parks that are bigger than our research parks. And they're coming out with things. I mean, we all know Tencent and uh, Alibaba and uh, Jack Ma. Xiaomi, the, the little uh, smartphone, they're coming up with their own innovation. And you can't be blind to that. I mean, I don't think you need to fear them in terms of fear, uh, but I, I think, uh, and Americans will. Uh, the, the folks that I've seen, you know, go on both sides, ah, nothing to fear. Oh, we are right. definitely great. I think it's somewhere in the middle. We have to learn. We have to learn about innovation. <laughs> they have a lot to learn about innovation. But with a million three people, a billion three people, uh, they have a lot more people working on it as a percentage than they think. And uh, a lot of things are happening there. And there are a lot of opportunities, especially to bridge, to, to bridge the two uh, uh, continents mm -hmm. sometimes. And there are opportunities certainly there. So a lot of innovation going on. Yeah, big part of the country, China, is uh, still maybe in the early or mid 20th century. But you'd be surprised how much of China is way beyond uh, where we are right, right now with their uh, innovation and their research parts and things that are going on. And, and for the Virginia and for a DC region, uh, I think China is a particularly great opportunity. You uh, want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the paper project. It was a mill, paper mill, right, project? It's, it's, it's a paper mill, but um, if it was just any paper mill, I wouldn't be excited. This company uh, from Sandal Province. Now, most people don't know Sandal Province. It's right next to Cleveland, I think. Well, <laughs> it's, 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 it's even better than that. It's the same province that makes uh, the beer, Qingdao beer. Now I know where it is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's between Shanghai and, uh, uh, and, and Beijing. Anyway, the, 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 the thing to remember about that is uh, and, and, you know, Chinese ancestry, right? So, uh, or uh, background. So, uh, very proud. I mean, uh, they're going to bring over disruptive technology in paper. And uh, the Chinese invented paper, what, 5,000 years ago, whatever. And, and uh, they want to reinvent. And uh, the reinvention is that this will not use uh, tree, tree fiber, but paper. It's going to use agricultural waste. So basically, uh, sustainable. It won't be cutting down trees. Uh, and it'll be totally using uh, what the farmers are growing right now and the paper that'll come out is actually free of a lot of the pollutants and toxins such a thing about when you have to dye paper and things like that. So very exciting project uh, being done already for decades in China. <coughs> so people normally don't think of the Chinese as innovative or innovations, uh, but certainly this is something that they've been doing for a long time over there, and uh, it's, it's coming to the United States. And I think it will benefit both countries. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great example of how the world of innovation really is flattening. Uh, it also, to my mind, creates an opportunity because we were kidding around about uh, uh, that region of China that nobody had heard of, but uh, obviously a lot of people have. My experience, having worked in international business for many years, is, is that uh, there is a, an advantage if you are from a region that people have heard of. Do you, do you get the sense that when you go overseas and talk about Washington, D.C., and, and a region, people know where it is? Well, Good, I, bad, I, I'll, I'll tell you what, um, uh, being, you know, working for the Commonwealth Virginia mm -hmm. is particularly dif difficult because people expect a city, right? And uh, so when we talk about Arlington, city county, 
Uh, they had Fair, especially Fairfax. Oh, Fairfax County is so big and everything like that. But when they ask you, well, put the city in front. Well, Fairfax County, County. It's very confusing. Northern Virginia. Well, where's Virginia? So uh, most folks overseas, now well, Europeans, they probably know a, a lot better about where, uh, where we're located. But in Asia, not really a good idea of where Virginia is. Then you say, well, right next to Washington, D.C. They say, oh, yeah, OK, I understand. Uh, but they don't understand how close it is. They say, oh, yeah, different state. No, it's, it's, it's uh, a, a lot closer than that. So yeah, we, we have a little bit of a, uh, not an image problem, but an identity uh, issue, especially uh, on the East Coast. On the West Coast, people tend to know where California is, mm -hmm. or, or Texas, or New York. Mm -hmm. But they don't know where we are. And where we are is really strategically important. Uh, great for logistics, uh, great for distribution, great for even distributing all the way to uh, across the Atlantic to Europe, so uh, it's it's a great location for, for businesses, especially those that uh, come from overseas. So let's we started to talk there about. Uh, did I did, is this back? Did I go back to my other job? I'm sorry. No, 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 no I don't work for the okay, state. Yeah, what you do? We all work for the state, Jim. You there you go. <clears throat> Everybody works there. You know, it's interesting you say that. Um, I've often thought the biggest difference between entrepreneurs here and, and Silicon Valley is that. Mm -hmm. uh, here, people work for themselves, work for companies. In Silicon Valley, people work for Silicon Valley. You know, everybody. That's a good point. Well, you know, yeah. this is the startup I'm doing now, but they're part of the the, the industry. You're absolutely right. Yeah, it's interesting. So, uh, so you you um, sold your business and you started to think about what the next act for you was, and uh, uh, that must have been interesting. What what was it like for you to grow a business and success and succeed and sell it? When it was so much who you were, what, how did you deal with that? I, I, yeah, that, that was what, what I mentioned earlier. Try not to be what you do. <laughs> Try to be you yourself, right? Uh, very difficult at, at the beginning. Uh, you find solace in things like golf, you know? <laughs> but then golf is not a solace-inducing uh, sport, right, or activity. Uh, and uh, you, you learn why uh, the pros get paid what they get paid. Right? Uh, but, yeah, as an entrepreneur, you want to get involved. And, and so I got back involved in the angel community. Uh, you know, some people had funds, right? right. I invested in yeah. all of those. Yeah, exactly. uh, got involved with it. In fact, uh, I think a couple of folks in this audience, like Stephen and uh, Stephen Chen over there, uh, got involved with TOTUS, uh, which was a uh, energy uh, saving, uh, efficient energy LED type mm -hmm. company and sensors and things like that. So, a uh, very exciting opportunity. Uh, and so, did things like that. We worked in, uh, to mentor small companies in, uh, in the angel community. Very exciting and very interesting to me. I got to travel a lot, got to meet a lot of interesting folks. So, so how did you find it uh, going from being an entrepreneur yourself, where you were in charge, to becoming an advisor and investor where you weren't in charge anymore? Yeah, be, being in charge is fun. I, I learned I had to, to change the way I taught. Really. Talking to employees for a long time, and then talking to other folks, you had to sort of like uh, change change the whole tone. Really? <laughs> and then going to, to the government, now talking to constituents, now you find out you work for them. Oh, we'll so. talk about that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. But but was it frustrating? Because I, I will tell you, I, I find that one of the most difficult things about being a venture investor is understanding that you're really a coach and cheerleader, and it isn't your company. And many VCs don't understand that. Totally with you on that. Uh, yes, but when you have basically 550 folks work for you, uh, it's different. Talk to someone that asks your advice but may not follow it. Mm -hmm. So that, that that's that's a learning process, <coughs> and definitely that's things uh, that's something that uh, um, a new a newly minted exited uh, entrepreneur needs to, to needs get. To learn. Accustomed to, but being a, a mentor, helping companies, sitting on boards, uh, you learn so much about people. You learn so much about uh, the industries and the different industries that, that you get involved with. Uh, and so, a big learning experience for me, but a lot of fun. And hopefully, this is good. Well, I think you did. That's the rumor, anyway. Ah. So, you're an entrepreneur. You want to know government? Explain that to me. Well. Um, you know, you always want to give back to your community, and uh, I thought that would be a wonderful way to do it. Uh, having seen, uh, especially what's going on 
back then in, in, in China and Asia and other places in Europe uh, where they were attracting a lot of businesses to their business parks. How did they do that? How are they uh, growing their economies? And so uh, I wrote a couple papers uh, to uh, the uh, to a, a person I've known for a long time, uh, Bob McDonald at that time, mm -hmm. uh, running for office. He was attorney general. And, and I learned that he was running for governor. And uh, I was very excited because I knew he was a great governor. And so I wrote a couple papers for him uh, on uh, international business and, and things like that. And uh, I got the opportunity uh, for the job. Uh, I'm still not sure how that all happened, but uh, it was very exciting. It got to give me an opportunity to uh, give back to the community, you know, provide a service back to the community, and learn more about the state. I mean, I've been here 30 some years, and uh, turned out there was a lot of places in Virginia I had not been to yet. I've been to all of them now. Yes, so, uh, <laughs> and it's a great state that you, you, you all should uh, take an opportunity to travel all over. So you're Secretary of Commerce and Trade. That was your title, right? And trade. So um, how many people did you have working for you when you had that job? Well, um, uh, direct staff is probably five or six. But uh, I had 13 agencies that are around between 1,500 and 2,000 uh, that's depending on um, the season. So I often hear uh, politicians running for office that have business backgrounds will talk about how their business background will help them be more effective in government. Did you find that your business background was actually helpful, or was it a hindrance when you started down the road of actually trying to create and implement policy? Good question. Uh, and, and I think my background particularly helped because I was a federal government contractor. So I was actually very pleasantly surprised. Now, government, I, I know there may be, in fact, I do know that there are a couple of federal government employees here. So I'm going to make a generalization. But I've watched federal government employees basically for the past 20 years, for most of my adult life, working with them as a contractor or, or owning a contracting business. So I sort of had an idea how uh, 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 government employees in general work. Uh, and there, there's good and there's bad. But you always have that bureaucracy and it slows things down. Turns out for a reason, right? You don't want unintended consequences and all that. But it is painfully slow sometimes to get something done. So I was very pleasantly surprised when I went to work for the state to find out uh, the employees, uh, great employees, the state has wonderful employees, and a lot of them are there. Uh, they could have gone to the federal government or, or somewhere else, uh, but they, they really care. And they're a lot closer to their governor, to their leader, uh, to their secretaries, to, to, to the delegates and the senators. When you look at the federal government, I think one of the big problems is uh, it's very difficult uh, to get uh, your elected representatives, uh, very difficult to, to get their attention sometimes, unless they have a very big issue. They have so many things to do, and there's so many layers and layers of bureaucracy. <coughs> in the state, uh, in, the, in the Commonwealth, and probably similar to many states, there are not that many layers. You want to go talk to your state representative, boom, he or she's there. And they have direct connections to the agencies. They can get things done a lot quickly. And so the employees here, I think, are a lot more service oriented. And uh, uh, they, they know that uh, folks are watching them and do something. So I was very pleasantly surprised at the effectiveness of state employees. Now, it's not true 100%, just like not true 100% for, for anything. But I found that generally it was a, it was a pleasant surprise in knowing that uh, my background uh, came from government contracting. So you'd do it again if you were asked? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Good Very to know. Easy. All right. Well, bear that in mind. <laughs> oh, yeah, <so>. yes, <laughs> government. government. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that question didn't turn out quite like I hoped. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we're going to move on. So, Jim, what, what, um, uh, what, yeah, you know, this is what friends do. <laughs> you know, I, I was wondering what 2015 was about, now we know. There yeah. you go. Okay. I am. <laughs> all, I mean, thank you for that out. I just all been captured for posterity. Tune in a week from Sunday, and there I'll be. Jeez. Okay. Well, I'm pulling myself together. Can you imagine a more terrifying thought than me as governor? I completely lost my thread of thought. God. Okay. So, <laughs> so Jim, I'm going to ask you a question. I hope you're going to talk for us and pull uh -oh. us all together. No. Okay. So, all right, what are you up to now? Oh, boy. Um, 
Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm trying to keep my wife happy by trying not to do too much, but I may be a little bit over. Dude, you're failing, right? I, I know I, that. I'm driving to, uh, I'm, I'm heading off to uh, UBA right after this. So uh, I'm, I'm teaching a class on entrepreneurship and financing uh, down there. It's a lot of fun. It's an undergrad course for engineers. So very, inter very interesting for me since I have a, uh, a business degree and not an engineering degree per se. So very mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, consulting for a few companies sitting on uh, a few boards. Uh, working with uh, some angel private equity you know, startup capital groups uh, up here, and uh, you know of one, and, uh, uh, and also in Richmond, uh, a couple of Richmond too, so we have a lot of good deals. And also still uh, working on some of these economic uh, development uh, deals that we uh, got started. Mm -hmm. uh, strangely enough, I'm also uh, working uh, up council as an attorney, and uh, my partner's out there, so don't laugh too hard. Please. Okay, well, <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, well you're a very good lawyer, I'm sure of that. You're a very good businessman. Um, so if you were going to write white paper now mm. for uh, for our new governor, yes. what would you write your white paper about? If you were going to give him some advice right now, what would it be? Well, one thing I learned is that uh, secretaries of commerce stay out of. <laughs> the former secretary oh, okay. stay out of the I'm business of the future. Okay. Uh, so, but uh, you know, I, I think they're continuing a lot of things that we're doing. They have a focus on entrepreneurship. And that's that's what I would, would, would focus on, entrepreneurship. Um, I think uh, this governor, uh, the current governor, is uh, really, uh, he's a great sales guy. He's out there trying to bring in businesses from uh, uh, all over the world. And I say that as someone in the other party. So, uh, yeah. But uh, I think uh, they are also, and so uh, I imagine he's doing a great job of that. Uh, but I would think that growing our own entrepreneurs, <coughs> motivating entrepreneurs in this state, uh, people that are here are close by, uh, to do more uh, <coughs> business here and to get inspired, to learn more. Uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's the key. I think governors, secretaries, and folks in state government can do a lot to instill that motivation and maybe do that little push for people to go into entrepreneurship. And, uh, you never know. You never know when the next big thing is or where it's going to come from. And I just hope it comes from here. Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay, so last last thing uh, I was asked is, what, what advice would you give somebody if they were trying to decide whether to become an entrepreneur? What? Well, to decide if they want to become yes. an entrepreneur? Yeah. I'll tell you what, if uh, if someone has the luxury of deciding, then they're not. Uh, they probably not. I, I think people sort of know that either they have to be an entrepreneur because of loss of a, a job or a layoff or a glass ceiling or something like that. I, I think some people definitely, and that's absolutely a fine way to do it. You don't want to find yourself in that situation, but uh, I think people will do it. Or you just have a passion for entrepreneurship. I think those are two main things that I've seen. Um, and if you have to actually decide, um, I think it's more about can you convince everybody else? <laughs> can, can you do it than actually decide? But certainly, uh, there's a lot out there on how difficult it is to be an entrepreneur, uh, how it's difficult it is to raise money, and how just about everything good has been done, unless you have something really special. So uh, I think that's that's where I, I leave it. Is you really have to decide. Don't do it just yet. You got to convince yourself first, and then convince everybody else around. Well, I have other questions I could ask Jim. You have, I always like to throw it open. Do any of you have questions you'd like to ask? Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, thank you for uh, holding this event, uh, and then also thank you for speaking a little bit about your experience. Uh, you know, you, you went into government services and you said at some point that it was because of the track record and the reputation which continued to help you, uh, when you grow your firm. What do you think was the differentiating factor? What do you feel you did differently to get in? Is it because of your, your dad's company? Or what did you do to get that thing done? Well, uh, I think the uh, uh, whole thing is knowing the customer. and. People can tell if you know what they want. Sometimes customers want you to read their mind. Okay. But the next best thing, if you can't read their mind, is to read everything out there about them and learn everything there is about them and ask really good questions. 
uh, before you bid on a contract, before you go after contracts. So especially for the, the federal government, the main thing is you know, the, the old sayings, you know, follow the money. And the government always spells out very clearly uh, what they want. And anything that's, that's not clear, it's up to you to find out uh, what, what, the, what, what it is. So it's really just doing your homework. Uh, making, making the, uh, uh, the personal connections, because you know, people still buy and sell from people. Uh, even though they have to go through an RFP process, even though they have to go through competitions, uh, it, it's, it's really that. Really knowing the customer, uh, really getting in there and finding out what they really want. Yes, sir. You mentioned earlier government contracting experience and renaissance in 2001 after the tragedies of 9 11. Um, my, my question for you is to kind of expand on that. You know, you mentioned. Um, you know, high evaluations, um, how did that change the approach the government contractors had in starting businesses, um, culture of the government contracting industry? Do you still think we're in that renaissance with you know, sequestration? Uh, is the renaissance over? Are they reevaluating, you know, the, you know, cultural change that they experienced in 01? I mean, kind of where, if the if renaissance was in 01 through 09, through 2014, 15, going on, kind of where is that progression? Well, well, this one maybe uh, uh, Jonathan has a little, as an economist, may, maybe more. But let, let me just say, I think it all sort of hinged on it's sort of a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. uh, after 9/11, uh, uh, 2001, uh, I think uh, Wall Street took a closer look at some of the public, uh, large public companies that were in the space, and they said, you know what, everybody's else, uh, all the other stocks, they dropped a lot of price, but you know, these other stocks, the stocks of the government contractors stayed pretty, uh, for pretty flat or went up. And uh, so, so they saw that. So the ripple effect all the way down to my little company and other companies like mine uh, worked for a while. Uh, but then, here's the reverse of that. Uh, government contracts uh, can go down the minute the budget changes. And there's a finite, there's a finite amount, finite universe uh, to government contracting, and that's the budget, the federal budget. What I would add to that is um, a little bit of context. I think that from 1990 up through uh, up through 2013, um, the the rules of how the government acquired technology was very much driven by the standard government services built to suit business model. Uh, and um, you know, it really started in, in the uh, the aftermath of the uh, of uh, the Iraq War when, the, when we demobilized. And effectively, what the government did was outsourced a lot of functions that were done previously in the government. And we benefited enormously as, as a region for that. Um, what has happened over the last couple of years, due to sequestration, but also due to uh, the change in national security threat dynamics, um, the federal government is less interested than they used to uh, in buying <coughs> technology on a service basis and more interested and growing more interested in buying it on a product basis. And so what we're seeing, the reason why we started Tandem NSI is, is to bring these different threads together that Jim is an advisor to Tandem and uh, other leading government contractors like Mike Daniels and Ed Bursoff and, and Dan the Young are also involved. What we all see is that the world is uh, changing rapidly and becoming one where research and development, for example, uh, is much more driven by, I don't care where the academics necessarily are, I want to find the best people. And uh, so what we think of as entrepreneurs, in our colloquialism, uh, the government calls non-traditional performers, meaning new sources of technology. And so we may, in fact, be at a moment in time where the old business models are starting to break down on the edges. Um, and depending upon what we do as a region, we'll either benefit from that, like we benefit from last cycle, uh, or other parts of the country that are really good at product creation, like Austin, Silicon Valley, and Boston, become much more relevant to the Washington, D.C. technology establishment. That's the biggest issue we face. And, you know, it was not lost on me or the folks about Tandem, um, and didn't, it, it concerned us a lot. We saw the president sent the last CTO back to Silicon Valley, Todd Park, and hired as his new CTO and deputy CTO two people from Google. Uh, it is a big deal. Um, that uh, that this administration looks for technology expertise elsewhere of that type. And um, that's really, just being a homer for a moment, that's what Tandem's about. You know, it's jump up and down and say, hey, you don't have to get an airplane to find technology. People, we're, we've got more software engineers and PhDs here in Arlington 
than we are in Silicon Valley, for example. So that's why I see the market right now. So uh, just continue on that on that thread. The services, government services industry is shrinking right now, uh, directly because of sequestration. We've also lost in Virginia a pretty significant base over the last several decades in textiles. What's the um, what's the future for Virginia, in your opinion, from a economic opportunity perspective? What do you think we should be building the the infrastructure to be known as? In the future. Well, I know what we're, we're attempting to do, and I think we're doing a good job of it. Uh, you mentioned textiles. Uh, you could add woodworking uh, and, and other traditional industries. Uh, and by the way, when we go overseas, that's what people think of us. You know, they think tobacco, they think uh, textiles, woodworking. Uh, woodworking, for example, um, you know, some of the traditional industries have gone away, but we have a huge base of uh, companies that are supporting, uh, like the Kias of the world, building things in southern Virginia. Um, but they're not doing with as much, uh, including Chinese companies. Chinese companies that were big suppliers to Kia, they're down there. Uh, but they're not hiring as many people, they're using hot tech. So one of our big things is advanced manufacturing. And, uh, that's partly uh, due to Rolls-Royce, the jet engine manufacturer, being uh, right outside of Richmond in Petersburg. Uh, so advanced manufacturing uh, and, and things like that are very going to be very, very important for the state. Higher added value, uh, but fewer employees. But these em the employees that they're going to hire are going to require a lot more training. So uh, that has another ripple effect through our education system. So we need to stay competitive with the rest of the world, period. I mean, it's uh, more or less free market, right? So uh, in order to stay uh, ahead of the competition, we're going to have to make sure that everyone, K-12, uh, advanced uh, higher ed, uh, all has to keep up with the uh, uh, international standards. Uh, they're all catching up, uh, or exceeding us. Uh, but still, we, see we have some very good advantages because we're here uh, in really the heartland uh, of the United States for distribution, for everything like that. So uh, we're here. Advanced manufacturing, distribution, life sciences, high tech, uh, still going to be the future of Virginia. And we're still going to have traditional industries. I think it's still going to be viable here. Uh, companies are coming here thinking of innovative ways to execute on these traditional industries, too. Right, Jim, thanks a lot for joining us today. It was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.